Good afternoon. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to worship this weekend. And just as last week I wasn't in the uh, sanctuary, I'm not in the sanctuary again. Uh, today I am finishing up cooking uh, in those pots our uh, 10 pounds of bacon and diced bacon and onion, two bags of onions I've been cooking up because the best way to cook an onion is in bacon grease, obviously. Uh, that they will, those will go in the ba baked beans that we're serving tomorrow at the fish fry. And so if you are uh, watching this the weekend it came out, uh, uh, September 11th or 12th, come on out Sunday night, 6 to 8. We'll be having a fish, fish fry uh, for the community, bring your lawn chair. It is our gift. We just want people to be able to get together. This is our uh, gift to our neighbors. So uh, that's the major announcement. And uh, here we go. We are continuing to look at uh, Paul's advice to Timothy and uh, the, book, the book of the Bible called 1 Timothy. And remember that this is a uh, book written, a letter written from Paul to Timothy so that Timothy has sort of a Swiss army knife, has a, a letter that he can pull out and use the various chunks of as needed to sort of authorize what, what he's doing. So we're going to get into this next chapter, but first we need to talk about Yoda, who is one of my favorite characters in all of science fiction. Uh, Yoda is the wise sage of the Star Wars universe, and, and I hope you have seen uh, a Star Wars at this point. If, if not, let me know. We'll, we'll watch one together. It'll be great. But um, at one point, the wise sage Yoda warns the uh, main character of one of the earlier movies, Anakin Skywalker. He says, fear leads down the path to the dark side. For fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. And uh, there is something profoundly true about this, that, uh, that what fear leads to is anger, and that then anger leads to dissension and tension and problems in, in a community amongst people. I think of this, uh, and I know this to be true in, in my own life, uh, for I have my own fears, and, and it is a decision that I have to make on a regular basis how to handle my fears. I have fears. Fears aren't always rational, right? So I'll tell you one of my irrational fears. This is a fear that is completely irrational. But I do have a fear that... Uh, in the future, in the Methodist Church, Methodist Church is going to shift in the coming years. I, in 2019, there was a gathering of Methodists from around the world in St. Louis. And I went down to volunteer uh, at this event so I could watch and see it unfold. And I wanted to be helpful. And uh, so I went down and my wife and kids went to Florida. It was in February. They sent me a picture from the beach of eating fish tacos while I was sitting ne next to a, a very cold door um, because my task was to deal with registration, specifically name tags. For four days, the four days of the event, as the Methodist Church sort of grappled with its future, uh, I was the one who made sure you were supposed to be there and had the right name tag. And name tags were hooked to voting, like it's, it's a big deal. There was one particular person who lost their name tag every day. Every day, this person came up. I've lost my name tag again, and like there are, there are groups in Methodism that want to embrace the the big tent nature of Methodism, and I'm, I'm that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a big tent Methodist. Like I think as long as we can agree that we're following Jesus, we can argue about the rest, and then have a potluck dinner, and then we'll get back together next week and keep on arguing about following Jesus. Like that's great. I am a big tent Methodist, and this person who is losing their name tag every single day is not a big tent Methodist. There are people on all parts of the spectrum. I mean, I'm not telling you where, where this person lands. All I'm telling you is that this person is someone who would love to see the church split quickly. And that like activates my fears. Like it, hit, hit, it hits my buttons. Like I'm afraid for a future of the church. And like, will I have a spot in this church? It's an irrational fear. I acknowledge this, but like I, I find myself, find myself getting just angry at this person. Can't you just hold on to your name tag? This is not 
rocket science, right? And, and so that, that fear of what this person stood for, was well, I was letting it drive me to like this anger at this person. I had to like get a handle on myself and step back and say, whoa, it's just a name tag, Andy, right? But uh, that, that fear that leads to like anger because I'm afraid of something and so I get angry at the people who are connected to that and then my anger could leads to, could then if, if I if I continue to act out on that I mean that can cause dissension and tension and, and, and suffering as Yoda warns um, what Yoda calls the dark side uh, the path of the dark side we would just call sin and um, okay here is your nerd bit of lore for the day if you have watched Star Wars you'll know that uh, People have various colors of lightsabers, usually blue or green, except for Darth Vader, who has the classic red lightsaber. And according to the mythos of Star Wars, the way you make a lightsaber red is you cause so much suffering with it. The, the kyber crystal, the stone that drives it, uh, weeps uh, blood because you've caused, drawn so much blood with it. And that's how you turn a lightsaber red, is, is you cause suffering. So there's your little moment of, of nerd. Um, has nothing to do with the sermon. I just think it's awesome. So when Paul writes this letter, back, back to church, when Paul writes this letter to go with Timothy, he is writing to a church to, that he's going to take to go serve Ephesus. He's writing to a church that um, has faced some real division. Pause. I'm going to go check the bacon. Okay, bacon's almost done. What a glorious smell. But uh, when... Paul writes this letter to, the, to go with Timothy. He's writing to a church. He's sending Timothy to a church that's deeply divided, the church at Ephesus. And, and so uh, the first uh, chapter of the letter had dealt with the division itself, like grappling with the way that this division is it, not a good thing. And, and what happens next is Paul instructs Timothy to do what Timothy already knows what to do. Uh, it's time to lead the church into prayer. Prayer is the foundation of any church. Any unity the church has is rooted in prayer. Any future the church has is found in prayer. For it is prayer that is the continual submitting of our dreams, our hopes, our desires, our plans. It's, it, prayer is con continuously, continuously submitting them to God. It is pr in prayer that we become partners with God and are tied together into something greater than, than ourselves. This is essential for a church, to have a sense that it is called to something greater. It is cru especially crucial for a church that is, that is divided. It is in prayer that a church that's arguing about everything else can find the one thing that can bind it together. We'll argue about everything, but we're praying to Jesus together. And as we get caught up in what Jesus is desiring, we can, we can do this, we can hold together. Thus, Paul sends this reminder that the church is to recommit itself to praying and praying for all the people in the church. That's the will of God, that we all pray and we be praying for each other. And we pray not just with those we agree with, but for everyone. And in, just in case, like, it's not clear what we're praying for. Like, Paul kind of pushes this and kind of twists it a little bit more. We're not talking about just praying for someone, because, like, there's the classic uh, prayer from... Uh, um, fiddler on the roof, that we pray that God keeps the czar far, far away, right? We, we can pray that someone is far, far away, but that's not what we're talking about here. I'm not sure that's really prayer anyway. It's like, God, yeah, well. Paul says, you are to pray with and petition for, to entreat on behalf of, to give thanks for, that's how we pray for each other. Right? We're praying people, we're praying for what they're praying for. We're entreating God for what is best for them. We're giving thanks for who they are. Even if we are struggling, getting along with them, we are giving thanks for them, for they are following Jesus, and we are thankful for that. Prayer, praying for what the other person is, is desperately seeking and saying, well, can, can that, if that is in your will, like praying for that. It, this is far easier said than done. It is not only praying for each other that Paul is directing the church at Ephesus to do, through Tim Timothy, of course. He is saying we need to pray for those who have civil authority, which in that day and age would not have been a Christian because to be Christian was still illegal. 
in the Roman Empire, uh, the only legally recognized religion was you worship Caesar and the pantheon of Roman gods. And if you had a really old religion, the Romans respected old. You can be wrong, but as long as you've been long, wrong for a really long time, the Romans wouldn't mess with you. So the Jews, they're obviously wrong. Weird monotheists, what, what's wrong with them, right? But it'd be the Roman line. But since they've been wrong for so long, yeah, we'll let them be wrong. Christians, they're new and wrong. And we can't, the Romans would not have anything to do with that. And so it was illegal at this point to be Christian in the first century. It would be illegal to be Christian for decades and decades to come. It would be enforced whenever a local governor or a Caesar, or a Roman emperor, wanted to enforce it. So it wasn't like a continual uh, persecution. But like, there was no one who was Christian who was in a position of authority. And so when Paul says, you're praying for each other, you're giving thanks for each other, and you're praying for your local authorities, like we're not praying for people in the church at that point. Right? We're praying for people who are not in the church, who could persecute the church if they felt like it. And so to pray for them, why do we pray for them? We pray for them, Paul tells us, so that uh, we can have a tranquil and quiet life, so that we can have a life of godliness and dignity, so that we can together be doing the thing that matters most as a church. Together, you, you church that's divided, together it is time for you to pray for your local authorities so that you can come together and make sure everyone experiences the good news, the gospel. Everyone experiences the, the, someone saying to them, Jesus loves you, let me tell you what that means. And again, that's what is going to be the unity of the church, praying and giving thanks for each other and praying that they might be bound together and following the gospel together, praying that the local authorities would be able to, to struct, structure a common good so that they can live a good life together so that they can then do what matters most. Not be arguing about who's baptized by whom, but focusing on we need to evangelize. Right? That's the word Paul would have used. We need to be good news to each other. We need to be helping and serving our neighbors. Again, for a church that's divided, to join together in prayer for each other and for a common good, right? That, that's what will hold them together. We argue about everything else, but we are going to follow Jesus together. We're going to serve our neighbor together. Paul write, wraps up this bit of advice by getting very explicit about the challenges he's hearing at Ephesus. He has some very specific advice. Uh, the men at Ephesus, he tells them to lift up holy hands as in prayer and do so without anger or dissension. And he has some very specific advice for the women of Ephesus, Ephesus to not compete over who has the fancier jewelry, the more expensive clothing. Now, it is important to note that this is Paul's specific advice to a specific group of people. It is this group of men who are struggling with anger. It is this group of women who is um, looking to evaluating people by their, their status, their, their, their sort of uh, how, how well they, they're able to dress, their, their sort of social status. And so Paul is not making a claim that this is going to cover everybody. <clears throat> Second, I think, uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm blazing any new trails to say that women are completely capable of, of giving into anger in the same way that men are, and that men are completely capable of uh, judging others by what others have or do not have. And so I think uh, we can take this as generally applicable advice. And I think that it's advice that is very specific and helpful um, when it comes to like finding church unity and prayer and finding a, a, a unity in prayer together as a church. Anger and dissension, that's what's, that is what's been rending the church, causing the divisions to continue. And, and so to, to lift up holy hands, when the the Jewish practice of prayer was not to put your hands together and bow your heads, but to raise your hands to get out and look up. So raise holy hands, literally. So to raise holy hands and to pray not in anger, not to pray in a way that leads to dissension, to pray as Paul had directed. Pray giving thanks for each other. And then pray without com competing or worrying about who's praying next to you. The person who's next to you is just as beloved of God as you are. And so uh, trying to judge people, look up to or down to, upon people um, based upon how they dress, how they talk, what they wear, 
their degree of education, uh, their family name, like all that is just, that's just secondary. We are praying together and that is what matters most. And I think this gets at like the, like maybe one way to sort of crystallize this advice is like to be a Christian seeking unity, praying together, is to be willing to be the person who lowers the temperature in the room. We walk into a lot of rooms where the temperature is high, where people are ready to argue. And to be the person who is willing to pray for and be thankful for every person there, whether we agree or disagree, to be the person who's not gonna look down on or up to people, just to accept every person in front of us as a gift, to not walk in with a sense of anger and dissension, but just lower the temperature in the room. I mean, that might be one way to summarize what Paul is trying to get at. Pray such that we are uh, peacemakers. That would be another, another word. So what, what do we do with this? I think it'd be accurate to say that division is, is still a problem in the church and, and in society. And, and so maybe, maybe here's what we could do this week. Maybe this is an excellent week for us to pray for the person who follows Jesus that we disagree with and we struggle with most. Now, we all know who that might be for me. It's the person who kept on forgetting the name tag. I'm going to spend this week intentionally praying for that person, praying, giving thanks for that person, praying for the God to work in that person's life, and just praying that the unity of the church might be more uh, than what he and I uh, disagree about, but it be, might be rooted in what we do agree, that uh, Jesus is Lord, and everything else we can figure out together as the church. I hope you can do this. Jo join with me and do the same. Who is it that, that offends, annoys, or frustrates you most? Can you pray and give thanks for them this week? Let's get up in the morning. And let's, let's start our day by being thankful and find that unity. A unity that we're not going to find anywhere else other than following Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this thing called church and the prayer that binds it together. We pray that in prayer, in bowing our heads to you, that we might be woven together as your people, that we might find that being your good news is far more important and far more interesting than anything else that tears us apart. We pray that we might be people who are lowering the temperature in the room, making peace as much as we can. We pray for the, this, every step that we take between here and the kingdom that is to come when your peace will overwhelm all things and this peace will, will be everlasting. Give you thanks for all these things. Amen. So, I'm going to go finish up uh, my bacon, Spradley done, and uh, I look forward to seeing uh, a lot of you over some fish tomorrow. Have a good weekend. Bye.